Okay, uh, let us continue. And our second speaker is Peter Sarnak from Princeton. And the talk is about this flow, entropy, and complexity. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great honor to be part of this celebration of Ruel and Sinai today. Uh, both uh, have had great impact on my work through their works. I remember as a beginning graduate student trying to read some of Sinai's work in Russian, because it was not available, not translated. Uh, had a great, the only thing I remember from that is getting a little bit out of it, but that the word field in Russian is polya. Is that correct? Absolutely. That's all I remember. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, luckily, uh, works of Ruel, and especially Rufus Bowen, who quickly understood these ideas, uh, started writing in English, and we were able to understand what Sinai and Mogulus were doing. Uh, uh, I, my talk today is based on something called the Mobius flow that I'll introduce that uh, I have been interested in for the last six years or so, and I'm going to give you an account of some recent progress. There's a, there's a lot of work on this that has been done by, by many people, and that's my purpose, is to sort of bring it up to date. Uh, and I chose it particularly because uh, a number of Sinai's recent works are in the subject, and I'll, I'll mention them. Okay, so let me explain the topic. It's uh, all just about this function, the Mobius function, which is a minus one to the number of prime factors if n is a product of distinct primes and at zero if n is not square free. Mu of n is a long stat studied function by people for, year, for hundreds of years and we still really don't understand that much about it, as I'll explain now. Anyway, this is what the sequence of numbers is if you compute it. And this lecture is about how random is this set of numbers, one minus one zero and so on. Can we capture the randomness in the sequence? And there are many ways of thinking about it. And the one that I want to discuss today is impacted by dynamics and especially uh, a notion introduced by Sinai and Kolmogorov called entropy. The reason, one reason this function is very important is if you take one over the Riemann zeta function, it's this product, it's some mu n over n to the s. So the analytic properties of one over zeta, which are obviously connected to the zeros of zeta, are connected to the partial sums n up to n of mu of n. And the prime number theorem is actually elementarily equivalent to the statement that summation mu n, n up to n, is little o of n. So, <coughs> the prime, unless you're not interested in the prime number theorem, and if you, aren't, if you find the prime number theorem boring, you'll probably find the rest of what I say even less interesting, but anyway. <laughs> The Riemann hypothesis can also be stated in terms of these partial sums because of the 1 over zeta, and the sum n up to n of mu of n is cancelling as if the mu of n's, remember they were plus 1, minus 1, or 0, so the 0 won't, con won't contribute, but the other values will contribute plus or minus 1, and the cancellation as if these were random numbers to square root of n, give yourself a safety valve of an epsilon there, is, to is very elementarily equivalent to the Riemann hypothesis, and this talk is not about the Riemann hypothesis, but it's just pointing out to you that the behavior of the plus, the randomness in plus minus one in Mobius is relevant. The question that I want to discuss, and if you look at the recent book by Kowalski and Ivaniets, it's a beautiful book uh, with all the modern technology of analytic number theory using tools that have been developed early on and also ones in the last 20 years. They discuss the following randomness law, which they describe as follows. I think this goes back to Vinogradov and Linick, at least. And that is that if you sum mu of n, remember, up until then, this c of n was 1. But now let me take an arbitrary bounded function. And suppose you ask whether the sum of mu of n against c of n will cancel. Is that little o of n? Well, if c of n is 1, that's the prime number theorem. And the randomness law says that if C of n is sort of a function that Ivanich can stare at it and tell you yeah, that'll cancel or not, <laughs> this is kind of the litmus, litmus test. Uh, anyway, if it's a reasonably defined function independent of Mobius, I mean, if it were Mobius itself, it wouldn't cancel, then this should cancel. 
So if this were, uh, we're going to try and make this precise in a second. Uh, but of course this is just not a well-defined notion. But it is a way that one predicts every answer correctly. I've never seen it predict anything incorrect, and it predicts twin prime asymptotics or anything, or k-tuple conjectures or anything like that, by using the following identity, that if lambda of n is log p, if n is a prime power and zero otherwise, then lambda of n, which is basically counting primes, whenever you count primes, you usually count them with weight log, it's very natural. Then lambda of n, this is an identity, is some d divides n of u of d log d with a minus sign over there. So if you have a sum over primes that you're trying to understand, you open it up with this little sum over there, and then you switch orders of summation, and you'll quickly predict the main terms of what, what's the answer by assuming that Mobius cancels against anything that is, it is sitting there which is not conspiring to be Mobius itself. So that's why it's a, a powerful, and, and in fact it's used, some proofs do proceed through this identity, of course. So, when I was thinking about this about six years ago, uh, the notion of complexity, uh, so I, I wanted to make this uh, notion precise. So what does it mean for C of n to be a reasonable function? So one way to say it is that C of n is of low complexity. Now there are millions of notions of complexity for a sequence, and one of them is the modern notion of computational complexity, which I would like to suggest is not the right notion because of certain beliefs that I have. That is, suppose C of n is computational, is in P, meaning polynomial log n in, to compute its value. So suppose I can compute what C of n is very quickly, polynomial of the number of digits. Then you might think that Mobius would cancel against C of n, that this would go to zero. However, that would, uh, that can only be true if actually computing Mobius itself is, cannot be done quickly which I don't for a moment think is the case, because I think you can factor quickly. I don't want to get into that debate, but uh, this question here, which is just a correlation statement, which, uh, which is the one we're interested in, is a problem I always raise when I give this lecture, because I think it's got an easy answer, and I, I, I've just failed in trying to do it, and no one seems to have come up with a good idea. And the question is, construct a sequence which you can compute quickly, which correlates with the Mobius function. Well, another way of saying it is if I gave you a very large number n, and I told you to square free, and I put a gun to your head and I said, is mu of n plus or minus one here, and I gave you one day to go home and think about it, do you have a better chance in a half-half that I'll shoot you? <laughs> That's correlating. Can you increase your chances by doing some computation? The answer must be yes, but I don't know. Anyway. The notion that seems to be much more natural, it's very closely connected to the techniques that have made tremendous progress, and that's what I'm going to describe, is a dynamical notion of complexity. The language I'll use here is actually that of an old paper of Furstenberg. I don't think we call dynamical, discrete dynamical systems flows anymore, but I'll use his notation here, which is from 1960. So a flow will be a topological space, compact topological space X with a continuous map. So this is topological dynamics. The measures will come a little bit later. But to begin with, I just have a, a, a pair, a transformation, a continuous map of a topological space into itself. So that's a very simple notion. And I'll say that the sequence Cn, which is the one whose complexity I'm interested in, is observed in this dynamical system is if it's, if there's a point in the space and a continuous function on the space such that C of n is f of t to the n of x. So it's the values of this function on an orbit of a point. So it's observed in the flow. So of course since f is bounded because it's continuous, this will give me a bounded sequence. And the idea is to def express the complexity of the sequence by the complexity of the dynamical, the simplest dynamical system in which you can realize that sequence. So if the sequence were the constant function, then you can realize this on one point. If the sequence were uh, periodic, you can realize this on a dynamical system which has got finitely many points. And otherwise, it could be very complicated. Uh, and of course, the complexity of the flow is the way I want to define the complexity of C. All right, so here we get to entropy. 
The entropy that uh, Kolmogorov and Sinai introduced, a beautiful and brilliant changing of the dynamical systems, uh, was the notion of measure entropy, which I think in Russian is metrical entropy. Is that correct? <laughs> Glad that I'm saying <laughs> my Russian is better than I thought. So that was another confusing thing. When you, uh, when you have a met compact metric space, you would normally talk about topological entropy, but in Russian that's metrical entropy. Anyway, we call it measure entropy. So uh, the kolmogorov sinai entropy is associated with a uh, transformation, which is a measure-preserving transformation. There's no measure here, so there's a notion of topological entropy, which is the maximum over all invariant measures for this in the setting that I have here, uh, of, of the measure entropies of Kolmogorov and Sinai. I think it was first introduced, this notion of topological entropy, by Adler and Kron, Kronheim. Kronheim. Purely topological definition, and it's the crudest measure of complexity, and it's measuring the uh, number of orbits this uh, flow has. How do you measure the number of orbits? You give yourself an, an epsilon and an n, and you say two orbits are epsilon n separated. If at some point between one and capital N they are different, and then by compactness, uh, given epsilon and n, there's a maximal n epsilon separated set, and then you take the exponential growth rate of that, taking first the limit lim sup as n goes to infinity and lim sup epsilon goes to zero, and that gives a number, and it's called the topological entropy, and the system is called deterministic if it's of zero entropy. And the zero entropy is the most important notion, as you'll see for this Mobius in a second. So these are topological entropies, however, in order to study anything at any moment, if we're going to have Birkhoff sums, which they will, the sum mu of n, C of n will somehow want to be a Birkhoff sum or related to a Birkhoff sum somewhere. So um, from that point of view, uh, there, uh, the minute you want to use a Birkhoff theorem, you would need a measure. So there will be many invariant measures, but if for every invariant measure the kolmogorov sinai measure entropy is zero, then the system's deterministic. It's got zero topological entropy. All right. Now, the first proposition that I want to explain here, it'll come from the end, is that mu of n is deterministic. Is, the mu of n is not observed in any deterministic system. If the Mobius sequence were observed in a deterministic system, we'd all go by that system because it would have all the answers that we're interested in because deterministic systems are quite easy to understand, not quite true, but certainly one feels that the ones that are of zero entropy, deterministic, uh, have great structure. So if there were a dynamical system which would spit out Mobius, we'd be very interested in it. There is no such system. You'll see why a bit later. And uh, I'm just leading to this conjecture that I want to report on. So much, and, and this I described, and the scene I got interested in it, I think maybe five years ago when I described it. I'm just reviewing this for everybody. A much stronger statement than uh, mu of n not being realized in a deterministic system is that you can't approximate mu of n by deterministic system in any way. And I will say, and I'll use the word linearly disjoint because, again, it's the same paper of Furstenberg that's relevant to set up this kind of abstract uh, formulation. Uh, the, the, this uh, idea of, of mu of n times xi of n cancelling is somehow that two systems are disjoint from each other, a notion that Furstenberg introduced for topological dynamical systems and measured dynamical systems. So I linearly disjoint here is because I only allow on the mu of n just mu of n, not uh, any expressions which involve mu of n times mu of n plus 1, which I'll return to in a second. So I'll say that mu of n is linearly disjoint from a flow if it's linear, if it cancels, if this sum is little o of n for every observed sequence in the flow. And now I can state what the main conjecture that... Uh, for which there's tremendous progress. I'll call it the Mobius randomness conjecture, and it formula formalizes and formulates very precisely what this man Mobius randomness law is. Is mu is linearly disjoint from any deterministic flow. That is, if you give me any sequence which can be realized in a deterministic flow, 
then summation mu of n, xi of n, should on division by n go to zero. Uh, so if xi of n is one, I'll give you hundreds and hundreds of examples of where this is now proved. All right, but this looks perhaps a wishful thinking conjecture, and I want to show, first point out uh, a statement which I don't think anybody has any doubts about and which implies the conjecture, so you shouldn't have too much doubts about it. I should say when I first was trying to formulate this, Elon Lindenstrauss was still a colleague of mine here, and I kept on asking him whether that conjecture might be true, and he kept on saying to me, no way, I haven't seen the worst zero entropy system. And he's right, I've never seen the worst zero entropy system. But once I was able to show that this consequence follows from a conjecture that I don't think any of us have any doubt, then I didn't have to, in a way, see the worst uh, system. All right, so there's a conjecture of Charlo, which is a much more natural and more basic conjecture, which has the feature that until just a, few, uh, a year ago, essentially no progress was made on this. And I'll report on one small progress that has been made, which is a remarkable breakthrough just last year. Uh, the conjecture says this, instead of starting to look what happens with mu of n against xi of n, which is what the, the conjecture was uh, all about, why not self-correlate mu? I mean, why bring all these xi's into the picture when <laughs> this is all of it just about mu? Right? And that's what we're really interested in. So the sum mu of n, n up to capital N, is little o of n. That was the prime number theorem. How about the sum mu of n times mu of n plus 1? Is that little o of n? Or is some mu of n, mu of n plus a1, plus a2, take any shifts? Is that still little o of n? And Charla made the conjecture that that should be little o of n. That is, if you know that n has got an e, so mu is essentially the parity, if you're not square free, then it's zero, and otherwise it's the parity of the number of prime factors. So is there a conspiracy in the world for a number to have an odd or even number of prime factors after you make an additive shift or a series of additive shifts? I think if there were such a conspiracy, we would have seen it. <laughs> I don't know how much this has been experimented on. The most uh, profound uh, feature of Charles' conjecture, if you actually go look at where it's conjectured in 65 in his book on the Riemann hypothesis and his other 100 favorite favorite unsolved problems, is there's a misprint. It's got big O N there, not little O of N, <laughs> which is trivial to prove. <laughs> That's it. Uh, you also have a misprint on the slide. Where? There's a slightly stronger version, which, right. This is still true, but there's a stronger version that one normally writes down. It's not a misprint. It's just not a complete story. <laughs> On what? In the second equation. Okay. Uh, all right. Now, there's no case of which this conjecture is known. However, uh, except when t is 1. Then it's just a prime number theorem. The remarkable advance due to uh, recently, about a year ago, of Matumaki and Radisville is that they are able to prove the first non-trivial statement about mu of n, mu n plus 1, or mu of n, mu n plus h. And that is that while this, when divided by n, is supposed to go to 0, it was not even known that the limb sup of this is not 1, that they can't line up so well that this would get close to 1 infinitely often. And that's what they prove, that some age, they've given any h, this number's not uh, worked out, it's, comes, it's probably extremely small, but there is a positive number, such that for any fixed h, this is true, as n goes to infinity. Uh, this is a remarkable theorem. I'll explain to you where it comes from. It comes from the study of multiplicative functions, just the properties of multiplicative functions. And in fact, there's nothing very special about mu. This conjecture uh, is all about the relation between uh, the divisibility properties of a number and when you shift how the divisibility properties of an arbitrary function, which is a multiplicative function of n. So it's quite natural that that kind of theory, which is a very abstract theory started by Versing, Erdos, and really perfected by Halash, 
that's used in this uh, uh, theorem of theirs, which I'll now describe what, what, what they prove. It, a slight improvement of this was given then by themselves, a, a variation, I would say, with Terry Tao. And uh, Terry Tao has actually pushed uh, a very smooth version of this. So if you re replace here, uh, instead of having some n up to n of mu of n, mu of n plus h, you put mu of n over n. So this remembers the initial segment. So this is a zeta smoothing, a very, very strong smoothing. So if you divide by n there, he's able to, by a very clever argument, he's able to remove, reduce this constant to one, to zero, I mean. So that is the following statement. Suppose you take summation mu n, mu n plus one divided by n, so that trivial upper bound for that is log of capital N. He can prove that's little o of log of capital N. Uh, that's not anything to do with primes. It's not useful number theoretically, but it was very useful. This is one reason that he developed it, or I'm not sure exactly, but it came around that he was able to solve some problem in combinatorics called the Erdos discrepancy problem using that, which uh, is clearly very nice. I won't go that direction. So let me tell you what this breakthrough of uh, Radisville and Matumaki is. It's about multiplicative function. So a multiplicative function is a function such that f of n m is f of n times f of m if n and m are relatively prime. So suppose I have a multiplicative function which is values between minus one and one. It's real valued, like the Mobius function. That's what it would be applied to. Then the theorem is the following. Given any multiplicative function, there are universal constants independent of the multiplicative function. This is quite remarkable. So there's this, as I said, there's this remarkable theorem of versing that if you have a multiplicative function, because it's multiplicative, f of two times m is f of two times f of m. So the averages of the function know about each other through multiples. So what Versing's theorem says is any multiplicative function has a mean value. You have a multiplicative function and you take summation f of n, n up to x, 1 over x, this has a limit. It's a strange abstract theory, but extremely powerful when you quantify these things. And that's what they're able to do. It's <coughs> highly non-trivial. They show that the averages of um, any multiplicative function on short intervals, so n is going from x up to x plus h, where h is growing very, very slowly, so this is the mean value of f on a short interval, will be very close to the mean value of a very long interval. Now the sum of Mobius on a very long interval is the prime, by the prime number theorem or the best estimates towards the Riemann hypothesis, in other words the best estimates in the prime number theorem would give you some cancellation in some mu of n, n up to capital N. Those are still due to Vinogradov school, the best estimates you would get there. So this sum we know, if, some, if it's something like Mobius. This we don't know, these are short sums of Mobius. H is arbitrarily small, well, that's not, not bounded, growing very slowly with all the parameters. So given delta and any H there, this is less than delta, so delta you should think of as small, so this is where we get at least some cancellation, but it, th this is not a statement for every short sum, but for all, but <coughs> very, uh, a, a small percentage of the integers X at which you're centering your short sum. This is a remarkably powerful statement, and that and nothing like this was known before their work. It was only known with powers. These kind of theorems were not known where you're allowed to make H what's essentially growing like log log <coughs> of uh, capital X in this picture. And that allows them to prove this theorem about mu of n, mu n plus one. If you could prove, Im improve their work to deal with mu of n, mu n plus one, mu n plus two, or shifts or arbitrary number of shifts, you would really be able to do something quite interesting in terms of entropy, I'll, I'll mention that later. But that doesn't look, that they weren't able to do anything along those lines. All right, so let me get back to the main conjecture, which is C of n against mu of n. And the, that Mobius randomness conjecture follows from the Charlo conjecture, and that's a purely combinatorial statement with entropy. So I have a purely combinatorial proof of that, which is why I believe this conjecture. Recently, these five authors, uh, one, two, three, four, five, yeah, have given a purely ergodic theoretic proof of this in the style of Furstenberg's disjointness theorem. 
So Felsenberg, in this disjointness paper, proved a remarkable theorem, say in the measure category, that uh, positive entropy systems are disjoint from zero entropy systems in this, and one consequence is this correlations, they are uncorrelated in these Birkhoff-like sums. So <clears throat> what this conjecture, this Mobius randomness conjecture, is really trying to capture that the Mobius sequence, mu of n, is some, some are a positive entropy system. It, I will explain, it's got some factors, it's, it's not, uh, uh, it's got some non-trivial positive factors, so that, that's an issue. But because I've put down linearly disjoint, some only allowing mu of n times xi of n, that kills all the bad factors which you will see in a minute. And then this kind of conjecture that Charla implies this, this randomness should follow from the general disjointness principles. I didn't see how to do that. I don't know that theory very well, so I just gave a purely combinatorial proof, and now there's a ergodic theoretic proof, which may be more, <laughs> maybe you guys would be happier with. Anyway, it's a fact. All right, so I want to explain that there's been substantial progress on uh, this Mobius randomness conjecture, and actually all the progress, uh, recent and old, is very closely connected to hard-earned theorems about prime numbers. In fact, this is usually one ingredient in uh, a breakthrough about establishing something about primes. Unfortunately, in all the, not in all these cases is there a striking number theoretic application because some of these, uh, uh, in order to get number theoretic applications to primes, you usually have to go beyond the statement that something's little o of n, but you need a rate. Powers of log gain, which is not built into the definition. And it was engineered that way because there are cases where we can prove this because we're using some serious dynamics uh, where things are ineffective and we don't have rates, so we get stuck. All right. And one reason that for much of this progress is that the method that allows you to try establish something about mu of n times xi of n, or sums over primes in a dynamical system, are controlled by a very important invention of Vinogradov called the method of bilinear forms or correlations. And what, what in, the, in the version that Vaughan has exposed beautifully, where one discusses type one and type two sums, I just want to say that the type one sums are Birkhoff sums for the dynamical system if xi is realized in a, in a flow f, and the type two sums are exactly Birkhoff sums for the joining of this f with itself. So that the language is just made for this in the sense that the type one and type two sums which are used to control sums of Mobius or sums over primes in by now standard way, have a purely dynamical meaning once C is realized as a sequence in a flow F. So this is why there's all this progress and all the progress is being made, except in one case that I'll explain, all the progress is being made is by understanding the flow and its joinings. All right, so I'm gonna give nine cases of, and I'm certainly not familiar with all cases. I, I've, they have seen many, many more cases of, of this conjecture being proved. But let's review it. The first most basic case is where f is a point, then it's a constant function, that's the prime number theorem. If f is a finite set, then the, this Mobius randomness conjecture is nothing more, nothing less than Dirichlet's theorems on primes in progressions. So that's the finite set case. A major breakthrough was made, as I just said a moment ago, by Vinogradov in 1937, who proved, he didn't discuss it in terms of this language, but he essentially proves the case of F being a rotation of a circle, or more generally, a rotation on a compact abelian group. So G is a compact abelian group, that's my space X, my transformation from X to X is T alpha of X is just rotation, X goes to X plus alpha. Uh, you can reduce the general case by the theory of characters to the case that Vinogradov did, which is an exponential sum E to the two pi I alpha p, if he was summing on primes, for example. So he invented a way of estimating such sums, which you can generalize to Mobius, that was done by Davenport. And the key idea there is eventually in Vinogradov's work, you need to uh, control sums of progressions, 
because he's summing, he doesn't sum on primes, he's summing on progressions, that's this bilinear method. So you're summing e to the 2 pi i n alpha, and that's a geometric series, and Vinogradov was the king of getting cancellation out of a trigonometric sum on a progression. And the bilinear form is when you join a, a rotation with a rotation of a circle, you just get another torus. So that you don't, the type 2 sum and the type 1 sum are all one and the same. And that's an easy case. But it was invented by Vinogradov. Very brilliant idea. Uh, recently, Leo and I, in a paper which we were trying to write down various categories of, uh, or families of, of dynamical systems, the flows F for which it's true, uh, it's not an obvious generalization, but it's not eventually reduces to Vinogradov's work, is if you have a compact automorphism, so suppose G is an abelian group and you have T is an automorphism of G, like G might be a torus and T might be a linear transformation which respects a torus. Uh, I meant to say this, this conjecture, this Mobius randomness is essentially if and only if you zero entropy. Any dynamical system that's reasonable, which has positive entropy, can produce the complexity in an orbit of pretty much anything you want. This is not quite true, so I'm not saying it's if and only if, but it's almost if and only if. So the, top, the zero topological entropy is really, if you're talking about the behavior of every orbit, is seems to be the exact right setting. And so if I have a, sorry, if I have a, uh, no. Where did it go? Yeah. if I have an automorphism of a compact abelian group like a torus, of course such an automorphism could be very complicated, like it could be hyperbolic with Markov partitions. In that case, this thing will, ha uh, will there, there will be observables uh, sequences observed which do correlate with Mobius. Uh, but if the transformation is zero entropy, which is the side condition, then the theorem is true and provable because there aren't that many zero entropy topological uh, automorphisms of a compact group. The next most complicated case, and the proof is not so different to Vinogradov, it, uh, it is the solvable case or the null potent case, so suppose I have a null potent Lie group N and a lattice gamma, that's my space X, and I have a transformation T, which is again translation on a null manifold. So T alpha of X is G times alpha on the cosets. Then uh, this Mobius randomness conjecture, in fact they called it orthogonality, and it's where I more or less started to think about these things. Uh, they generalize Vinogradov's method, and they are able to prove this uh, Mobius randomness conjecture for null manifolds with translations. I should say that just like Vinogradov, I didn't say with Vinogradov, in Vinogradov this was the main new tool beyond Hardy and Littlewood, this, this, joint, uh, this uh, cancellation that I described in his introduction of the bilinear method. That's the main new tool that he introduced over and above Hardy and Littlewood in order to prove that every sufficiently large odd number is the sum of three primes. Uh, his proof really does much more. It solves any linear equation in three variables, inhomogeneous, as long as there's no local obstruction, you can always solve it in primes. One equation, three unknowns, you can solve in primes. And uh, the great generalization of Green, Tau, and then finally also with Ziegler, was to understand how to generalize that by using other methods of Furstenberg, in particular his proof of Sembaretti's theorem, and the key role played by null manifold in the proof of Sembaretti is a critical thing here. So in their work, which is five papers, to generalize Vinogradov's theorem, Vinogradov's theorem is one equation, three, one linear equation, three unknowns, their generalization, as long as you're not degenerate, is a system of uh, linear equations where you have two more unknowns than you have equations. Always you need two free variables and they've generalized and can solve linear equations in primes. Their work is a, I view it, uh, it contains this long arithmetic progression theorem, but their real work is it's a complete natural generalization of Vinograda from one to a system of linear equations. In their works, their five papers, paper three and paper four are concerned with this Mobius randomness in the case of a null manifold. And their proof in that case is uh, not so different to Vinogradov. 
All right, so let's make the dynamical system more complicated. Still zero entropy. Each time the system's more complicated, we're learning mu more about mu. That's the, the name of the game here. You're learning much more about the randomness. Eventually, you want to do it for all zero entropy systems. And that seems quite hard. Anyway, a case that uh, I was very interested in uh, is the case of uh, uh, unipotent dynamics, unipotent homogeneous dynamics. So we take SL2R over gamma. That's X, and we take a unipotent transformation. And that kind of transformation is uh, unipotent or quasi-unipotent, or exactly the translations on these G mod gammas, which are zero entropy. If it's positive entropy, all bets are off. So we have to stick to zero entropy, hence the unipotent. And in that case, uh, Bergen, Ziegler, and I, a few, couple of years ago, were able to prove this Mobius randomness conjecture, this disjointness for any horror cycle flow. One of the key inputs was to finitize Vinogradov's methods and then to compute joinings of a horror cycle flow with itself. The only way anybody knows how to deal with that is Ratner's work. So it's, and it's precisely because we're using Ratner's work that we lose all effectivity. Nobody knows how to make Ratner's theorem effective as far as equidistribution. Uh, and hence, we don't have a, a, a stunning prime number theorem that goes with it because we don't have any rates. So we are only able to prove this Mobius randomness, but nothing about primes. And that remains a very challenging problem that Ubus and I have written about, but we failed. We got somewhere, but we failed. Very recently in this year, uh, Ryan Peckner, in his thesis, generalized this theorem to all homogeneous dynamics by using Ratner's disjointness theorem for any G mod gamma. So essentially, in the case that your dynamics are homogeneous linear dynamics, then the conjecture is true. And those are 90% of the applications that we know at this point, because more abstract systems uh, we haven't understood yet. All right, so I said that one, I, I said this about uh, the lack, because we're using Ratner, we aren't able to say anything about primes, just uh, we have this finite, as I said, version, and at, at a critical moment, the uh, type 1 sums are easy to study in G mod gamma, where G is SL2R. That's because we have an effective Furstenberg theorem about the unique ergodicity of horror cycle flows. That can be made effective. But the minute you start with the joining of a horror cycle flow with it itself, effectivity, uh, only Ratner's methods work. That, the case of SL2 cross SL2, the joining of a horror cycle flow with itself, is a good chunk of Ratner's major works. It was done quite a bit earlier. It was in 84 already that she did that work. Other cases which are known are interval exchanges. Since uh, Bergan got interested, he was able to do many cases, and he did many cases of interval exchanges, as did Ferenzi and Madut. A very beautiful case of uh, this disjointness is the morse kakutani sequence. So let me give you a beautiful theorem which is proved by this disjointness. It was proved before the formulation of the conjecture, because, just like the prime number theorem was proved before. But the tools are the fact that you can do this dynamical joinings. So suppose I write n in base 2, and then I sum the digits, and I look at the parity. So I get a 0 or 1. So for each n, this is a number which is 0, 1, and that sequence as a function of n is called the Morse sequence. It's a sequence of zero entropy. You can make a dynamical system out of it, the Morse flow. It's zero, zero topological entropy. There's some very nice generalizations of Kakutani and Veach, for which this Mobius randomness, Veach has now proved these conjectures also. Anyway, let's look at this case, because the disjointness when it's proved here, it comes with a rate, so you get a prime number theorem, and the prime number theorem is a beautiful prime number theorem. It, it, it's as beautiful as they get. This is due to Madut and Rivat in 2008. And that is, if you take a number n, so forget everything I'm saying, you just forget this beautiful theorem, just remember this theorem. Take a number n, write it in base 2, add the digits, look at the parity, you get a 0 or 1. If you go over the primes, that is equidistributed half the time zero, half the time one. That was a conjecture of Gelfond, beautifully proved. And that's a typical case that you can do because this is a, this Morse uh, is zero entropy and very structured. 
I put in a lot of effort to this example because a natural class in which you might try to prove this conjecture are distal flows. They start with a rotation, which we understand, and then build distal flows by skew products, a construction again of Furstenberg, critical in, in this understanding of, dynamic, of these dynamical systems. So we just took, this is Leo and myself, just took a skew product of a circle with itself with a nonlinear skewing. So X is S1 cross S1, and the, that's the compact space. The topological, the, the map is just to rotate the first coordinate. So zeta 1, zeta 2 are modulus 1. You multiply by e to the i 2 pi theta. So theta might be a Liouville number here. That's your enemy, by the way. And then in the second coordinate, I multiply by any continuous function. And this is called the skewed product. Uh, it's distal, so it's zero entropy. So the conjecture should be true for this. But as Furstenberg showed, this dynamical system has got a new feature which prevents all the other proofs working, including Vinogradov's working directly, because in all the other cases that you've seen so far, there was a rigidity for the uh, Birkhoff sums at every single point. So if you have a rotation of a circle, the averages, uh, well, will depend on what the closure is in a torus. In Ratner's work, the averages are algebraic. In these more sequences, you can classify all the invariant measures, and then all the joinings, and that's how that's eventually proved. But in this case, there are points in this system at zero entropy which are not stochastic. So the Birkhoff sums in these points simply don't exist, and there are many such points. And that was a construction that Persenberg has in his skew product paper. So these are far, far from uniquely ergodic, but there's zero entropy, so, the mo so there's no prime number theorem. There's no nice behavior on the sequence. But Mobius is supposed to be jumping up and down sufficiently quickly, <laughs> randomly, and that's what that entropy, you know, in order to beat every configuration that this system has to offer. By the way, the combinatorial proof that zero entropy, uh, that Charlo implies that is just exactly that. You look how many configurations you get and you just beat every configuration that a zero entropy system can only provide a few configurations. Something of positive entropy has many configurations. So this is a very good test case. And we were able to prove this, Leo and myself. So this, the reason it's a good test case is uh, this has no application. It's more just to understand the, that the right statement with Mobius is zero entropy while there's no rigidity of the orbits. So we were able to prove this if the gluing is analytic, but we had a very weird side condition about the Fourier coefficients of this function on the circle, which is a re a real analytic, so it extends to a small neighborhood, is we wanted some kind of uh, non-lacanarity of the lower bounds on the coefficients, which seemed like a technical strange thing, but we couldn't get rid of it. And remarkably, Jiren Wang, just very recently, was able to remove that. So in these cases where the rotation number is very liable and the orbits are behaving terribly, at least to me they look terrible, and we have to analyze by many different means, including this method of Ziegler, Bergen, and myself, the missing cases that we couldn't do are handled quite brilliantly by Wang, Jiren, and he's using, for the first time in this kind of problem, the breakthrough of Matomaki and uh, Radisville on, so the theorem that I told you, mu of n, mu n plus one, multiplicative functions on short intervals. When you get down to the bad cases we couldn't handle, he's able to input this information of short sums compared with long sums. So the theorem is now true for any analytic gluing, but so far he has not been any, he's skeptical that these methods would work on a smooth or continuous gluing where it should be true. All right, now I want to get to Sinai, <laughs> and I still have, I think, 15 minutes. So the reason that the Mobius has, uh, is not realized, there's a good reason why Mobius is not realized in a deterministic system, because it's damn random and complicated. But there's a very trivial reason that it's not realized, and that's got not so much to do with the Mobius taking on the values 0, 1, and minus 1, but just the values that it assumes uh, if I square those numbers, in other words, the zero and the one. And this is the non-random part of Mobius that always has to be understood, and right now we understand a lot about it. So let me make a dynamical system, something that I would say, well, this is just tautology, why on earth would you ever make this, but let's make it anyway. 
So I'm going to take the Mobius sequence. It's a point in minus one, zero, one to the n. And then I have the left shift. So I want to make a topological uh, shift, a compact space in which this Mobius sequence lives. And it's the simplest, I mean, uh, the, the least entropy go, which will contain it. So let's just make it. So we take omega, we shift with t to the j, we close it up, we get a compact subset of this compact space. t acts by translation. I have a system, I'll call that the Mobius system, the Mobius flow. We know very little about it unless, if you give me Charles' conjectures, then in some 11 pages of notes where I prove, uh, state a few things, uh, I explain everything you want to know about the system in terms of relative extensions and things like this, but those are not proofs. Those would have to assume Charla. However, there's one very simple thing going on here, and it in, uh, there's another system which is a lot more interesting than you might think, and it's the following. Let me do the same thing. Instead of taking mu, let me take mu squared. So this, these numbers are not just 0, 1 to the n, and I close it up in omega 2. This system, which we call the square free flow, is a factor in the sense that Furstenberg was describing in the previous lecture. It's a factor of the Mobius flow. So if I first apply T and project, this is onto, and this should be S. That's a misprint there. And the projection map is just square. It's a continuous function. So the square free flow is a factor of the Mobius flow. And if the square free flow were complicated, then the Mobius flow is just even more complicated. And it turns out that the square free flow is something we can say a lot about, and it's extremely interesting. It's not a homogeneous system, it's not sophic, it's not a shift of finite type, but it's uh, something very natural that comes out of square free numbers. So one can use an elementary sieve. Sorry. One can use an entirely elementary sieve this should be an S, as I said. You can use elementary square-free sieve, as it's called. This is quite easy to actually characterize what points, what the points are in omega two, which are limit points of this of the closure of square-free numbers. The fact that you can do that means it's clearly <laughs> not that complicated. Anyway, it is complicated because this is now topological system, and quite remarkably, it's got positive topological entropy. So the square-free flow has positive entropy, it's got a continuum of invariant measures, it's extremely complicated, and the one of maximal entropy is now being identified also by Pechner last year, it's also part of his thesis, who proved a remarkable, and this is quite difficult, that this system is intrinsically ergodic. It's got a unique measure of maximal entropy. I always thought these are easy things to prove <laughs> until you have something which is a serious dynamical system, which is not homogeneous. Uh, his proof is uh, highly non-trivial. I'll mention that Benji Weiss and co. have another proof in a second. Anyway, that's a very important fact about the square-free thing. It's got positive entropy. It's got a unique measure of, of, of ma uh, maximal entropy. And it's also got a topological Kronecker factor. So there's a topological Kronecker flow, continuous flow, which is the product of Z mod P squared Z. This is a compact topological group, and you take the transformation x goes to x plus 1 in each coordinate. That's an ergodic topological Kronecker flow, and this is not a factor of the square-free flow, but it is, has a non-trivial topological joining. It's an example, uh, Fersenberg in his paper, of the topological joinings and also measure which do not have factors. This was answered brilliantly by Rudolph in many, in a complete theory. So the notion of, of a common factor and joinings is not the same. So you made a good definition and understood that you better define it that way. And this is, this is another example of that. Anyway, uh, so there are many invariant measures. And the most interesting invariant measure, besides the one of maximal entropy, by the way, that already shows that mu can't be realized in a zero entropy system. Because if mu were realized, so would mu squared be. And mu squared has positive entropy, so it'll never be realized in a zero entropy system. So it's a trick. If I replaced mu, let me face up, if I replaced mu by lambda, which is just minus 1 to the number of prime factors rather than the square free feature, then it's a very important unsolved problem. Does lambda have positive entropy? We have no tools to handle that at this point that I know of. It's, that would be a consequence of my conjecture that that would have positive entropy. 
In any event, uh, the, this positive entropy of the square free flow is, is very nice, but there's another measure. Am amongst all the invariant measures, there's a very nice invariant measure. It turns out that the point eta that I started off with, so now I'm going back to the genesis of the flow, so the point eta was a point uh, of square free numbers inside the closure. That point, if I apply t to it, that's a sequence of points, you could ask, is that point equidistributed in the space relative to some measure? And the answer is yes. And I'll call that measure nu. It's a natural measure because it's the one relative to which this starting point is equidistributed. And I was able to show that this is an ergodic system. S with that invariant measure is actually ergodic. I was able to show it has zero entropy. And I was able to show that measure theoretically it's got this uh, Kronecker flow with Haar measure as a factor. Yeah, but I was sure that S was more, co more complicated than this Kronecker factor. And so I was blown away when Sina and Celerossi came to me. They still got interested in this problem and told me that they can prove that this system is uh, isomorphic measure theoretically to this k uh, I have a factor map. It turns out that, that they're telling me this factor map's one to one, which I didn't guess and didn't, I had a completely the wrong intuition. Their proof is entirely different. They just take this particular system and they are able to compute the entire spectrum. So they use the von Neumann theorem that there are certain they take the Koopman operator and compute the entire spectrum for this unitary operator where I just computed the constant, the function one, to check it's ergodic, uh, it didn't occur to me that you might be able to compute the entire spectrum. And they beautifully, by another method, compute the entire spectrum, hence then apply von Neumann's theorem to show that this particular square free flow with that particular measure is zero entropy. So there's a, your zero entropy factor if you were to work measure theoretically with the natural lift of this measure to the Mobius. So the Mobius uh, is, um, is not a purely Bernoulli thing. It's got these uh, this Pinsker factor that's being identified here, if you assume Chala. Otherwise, these are all just conjectures. All right. Um, these results have all been, the stuff for square free has been generalized in papers of uh, uh, Lemanchik and others and Benji Weiss and a, a completely different to proof to Pekna of the uh, 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 intrinsic ergodicity has been given. Maybe a simpler proof. It's quite different. And these are all true quite generally and they are generalizations to number fields of square free flows. The measure theoretic aspects are with a measure new by Celerossi. And this is not the old Vinogradov. This is maybe yeah, a young Vinogradov. <laughs> Uh, a student of Yasha. All right, uh, another direction which uh, Sinai and his collaborators and students have been working on is a generalization where, so it's quite difficult to do mu n, mu n plus one, but what they are able to do is look at what are called smooth numbers. So they look at a model, they call it omega capital N, of all numbers, whose, all of whose prime factors are less than capital N and are square free. So that's a set of numbers which are called smooth numbers. The number is smooth if, is capital N smooth if all its prime factors are less than capital N. Now smooth numbers have uh, uh, been studied a lot in connection with many things and there are, well, uh, there's the most basic theorem about smooth numbers is how many numbers less than Y are there, less than X, which are Y smooth? So how many numbers less than X are there all of whose prime factors are less than y, where y is maybe a small power of x. And that is given by uh, an asymptotic with an exponent. It's a positive proportion, and that's called the Dickman function. So there are many numbers, but of course, if you let y get to be x to a very small power, that Dickman function blows up. And if it becomes very small, then the density tends to zero. So what they do is they put a new probability measure on the smooth numbers weighted in a natural statistical mechanics way, and then they compute what Mobius looks like in various other functions, and they find some great generalizations of the Dickman function. So that's a chapter in smooth, smooth numbers, which I won't go into, but it's something much easier to study, but they have added a very beautiful probabilistic and statistical physics side to it. 
All right, I think I'm running out of time. So let me just end with the following statement. I posed a problem, and I really want this problem solved, and that is, can you give me an algorithm to compute mu of n quickly besides factoring it? Uh, and the answer is that we do, uh, Rubenstein and I have something which is starting to look like that. It may do better than factoring. We haven't understood this completely, but let me just explain this. And it's not for all numbers, but I just want to point out that root, uh, this Mobius and this plus minus one comes up in number theory very naturally in the context of, of ramification. So suppose I give you uh, an equation, an elliptic curve, defined over the rationals. So I'm now discussing quick ways of computing Mobius. So I give you an elliptic curve. It's y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b. A and b are massive numbers. The discriminant of this is some big number n, which I'll assume is square free for the moment. So that's called the conductor of the elliptic curve. And I want to compute uh, the root number of this, of what's called the L function of this elliptic curve. Now, whatever this root number is, it's, uh, it's derived as follows. You look where this elliptic curve or whatever your object is that you're looking at has bad reduction. So the places which P's, which divide the discriminant, that's where the elliptic curve is going to have bad reduction. And at each such factor, you prescribe a 1 or a minus 1 depending on what the thing looks like when you reduce mod P and you see your elliptic curve mod P. So if they, uh, in a typical situation, I'll switch a sign for each prime factor if I'm square free. So the root number for such a thing and the Mobius are essentially the same thing if you set it up right. So the question is, how can I compute this plus minus one that we're so interested in quickly if n is even the conductor of some variety, in this case, in the elliptic curve? So Rubinstein and I have a sub-exponential algorithm in n. So it works. We, he's still implementing it, but I have no doubt that it'll work because uh, he's tested it on all sorts of examples. Uh, test cases. There's one conjecture you have to assume uh, that I'll explain in a second. Anyway, it's a sub-exponential in n, meaning it's going for, uh, you, you give me any epsilon, it'll run in less than n to the epsilon steps. So I remind you that factoring, they are sub-exponential algorithms to factor, but they're not proven to f do so. They just run well in practice. They make assumptions as we will in a second. When this algorithm stops, it gives a root number. And the only thing that's random is whether it'll stop or not, because it looks for something that unusual should happen, but it, it finds it with probability that's extremely high. So it computes a root number very quickly, but it never factors the number. So I want to point out that this is a way, and uh, it's, it's something about local to global. You are looking at this equation, and you're trying to look at the solutions to this equation for small primes, and trying to guess from that where something about the big primes where the thing has bad reduction. So we're using the theory of L functions of elliptic curves heavily. In fact, we're assuming the Riemann hypothesis for them. That's the only thing that's assumed. So when the program stops, it gives a complete and correct answer assuming the Riemann hypothesis. The place where I'm assuming something are conjectures of Nick Katz and myself about how the zeros of a family of L functions varies when you vary in the family. And that's supposed to follow random matrix theory, something which has been numerically verified. And that's why I am quite confident it's going to work that way once he starts to look at real examples with very large conductor. So the running time depends on a conjecture of Katz and myself. And the truth of the answer, it's a Las Vegas al algorithm, meaning the actual, it comes with a certificate. That'll only depend on the Riemann hypothesis. But for the purpose of me putting a gun to your head, you can assume Riemann. That's not something you should be worried about. Thank you. <laughs> Gee, I, I actually didn't even know. I think I, I finished in lesson oh, early. Yeah. It's unusual for me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Right to check 
and Gaussian random processes with singular spectrum. This is a big class of dynamical system with zero entropy, but very simple, such everything. Uh, so I think uh, that's, I don't know, that sounds very interesting. In terms of the Mobius flow, so if you, want, if you take the closure of this orbit and you take capital M, if you believe Chala, we know everything about M and about all correlations and about uh, Pinsker factors relative to the various invariant measures that present themselves of which the one of positive entropy is, is one type, the topological one, but relative to that A turn it's left. So in terms of the uh, realization of a dynamical system out of Mobius, the, uh, there's no mystery to me. It's just that we don't know any tool to prove it. Now what you're suggesting would be some, the, the uh, dynamics, the, the questions of, of uh, disjointness really involve how the thing uh, is behaving, uh, wh what kind of blocks you see when you vary along, what kind of blocks of yeah, one's you mind. You can calculate it everywhere. You can, you can calculate this answer completely. Yeah, yes, because we know that what the factors are. This is the right language for a certain kind of Mobius randomness principle. But I think where uh, what you're saying may be very relevant is suppose I don't, these sums are always just some n up to capital N and correlations. If you start to expand and ask about sums up to root n, if you think of some process like that where it's connected to the Riemann hypothesis, then uh, I'd imagine that other it's system. It's not number theory, it's, it's assumption uh, that maybe. Are you, you're saying to me I should be checking the conjecture against some zero entropy systems which are much more wild? Yeah, yeah, this. Uh, yeah, okay. I don't, in each case, the only zero entropy systems are the ones we look at one at a time. So I'm very interested in the following. What is the ultimate prime number theorem? So here, I do have a question for you guys, all of you guys. The prime number, I have a question, yes. This is the audience for this question. So let me ask this question. The Mobius disjointness is clearly connected just with zero topological entropy. That's the only condition on a system such that the Mobius flow, and that's very much connected with Furstenberg's, if you have something of positive entropy, like a Bernoulli, it's, it's completely disjoint from all zero entropy systems. That, that's what we're trying to understand here. I want to know the dynamical prime number theorem. I have a dynamical system X with a topologi uh, topological dynamical system uh, maybe it's uniquely ergodic even. And so I know wh what the behavior of the orbits on the, pri uh, on the integers are. The Birkhoff sums converge to the integral of f. I want to know that, is it true that if you go on primes, uh, at prime times, is it still going to be true that you have a prime number theorem? Is there a prime number theorem for your dynamical system? So what's the right rigidity conditions on your measure theoretic dynamical system, which let's assume is uniquely ergodic, for a prime number theorem to hold. And it's not zero entropy, it's much more rigid. So we believe that such a theorem is true in homogeneous dynamics. In the case of a torus, that P alpha mod one is equidistributed with alpha irrational, that's Vinogradov proof. For null manifold, that's a theorem. For SL2R, we don't know how to do it on primes, but I have no doubt it's true because we only know how to do joinings in a very weak way. But I'm interested in what's the class of topological uh, measure theoretic systems of zero entropy, what's the extra rigidity you throw on a system to have a prime number theorem? And that would be the ultimate prime, dynamical prime number theorem. In other words, the orbits on the integers are well behaved, the orbits on the primes should also be well behaved. Yeah. Okay, what's a Gaussian dynamical system? The system which is uh, described by Gaussian distribution. But with single spectrum. Ah, okay, that's the thing that you want here with singular spectrum. The answer is yes. Bergan has proved some, he's done some interval exchanges which have singular spectrum, I'm pretty sure. No, but uh, in this case, <laughs> I'm just saying there are some examples. Yeah. 
But in this case, the possibility of simpler spectrum of all kind of behavior is much bigger. Yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, I, I, you asking me a question. I'm asking you a question. You telling? Uh, I believe that zero entropy is absolutely not the answer for the prime number theorem. I'm asking, what is the right rigidity class of dynamical systems for which the primes are sufficiently random so that the Birkhoff egodic theorem holds for every point if the system were uniquely egodic when you sum on primes? Uh, it, and I'm telling you, homogeneous dynamics is sufficient. That I'm sure of. Okay, that's, let me leave it in there. Yeah, yeah. Here, one of your examples were doing circle to itself by a real analytic function. Right. And uh, so for real analytic, it's done, but for school, you were saying it's more difficult. Uh, suppose we assume that the Fourier coefficients of the function we use to glue are, are random numbers. Does it? Yeah, uh, it's an interesting question. I should say that uh, the minute you randomize something, the, there's this amazing uh, old theorem of Bergen that the Birkhoff, I don't know, maybe it was a conjecture of, uh, of uh, the lady in Chicago. Anyway, that the Birkhoff egotic theorem applies to uh, almost everywhere, it applies not just for the integers, but it applies for polynomial subsequence, prime subsequence. Uh, but again, proved it. What, uh, he proved it, but it was a conjecture of, I forget her name. Anyway, what? No, no, she was married to a Nobel Prize Bella. literature guy. What? Bella. Bella, that's it. Bella, conjecture of Bella. Yeah. Uh, and so Bergen proved this conjecture. So if you have any measure, so the minute you randomize your anything of that nature, so, so instead of saying, so almost every point you have Birkhoff egotic theorem. For almost every point you also have a Birkhoff egotic theorem if you go to primes. So if you randomize the coefficients, it may be true for another reason because you, ever, you I suspect it's quite easy to prove in that case. That's my guess. But even within one dynamical system, if you randomize the point, then the uh, Birkhoff egotic theorem, this theorem I'm saying, is true for almost every point from a completely general principle. Birkhoff egotic theorem is true on primes, it's true on squares, it's true on anything that you can estimate vial sums for on the circle. That was Bergen's insight. Yeah. Uh, I think that everyone is almost happy to sacrifice part of your lunch. <laughs> 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 that, okay. We have to stop, so thank you very much.